This is the First World War as you've never seen or heard it before. Transforming grainy archive footage to vivid living colour. We were in conditions that isolated us completely from civilization. Director Peter Jackson has employed all his Oscar-winning skills to bring the past to life and try and show the Great War as frontline soldiers experienced it. It's a chance for these people who are long dead, they're all dead, but they now speaking to us, telling us there's the story of the war. And the one thing the restoration did is it just brought their faces to life. You know, the, the, the faces of these people suddenly, where you don't really notice them when they're all sped up jerky, suddenly they, they kind of just come into a, a focus almost that, and then that one, that, seeing their faces, I, I just thought, well, we can't have any sound other than the voices of the guys that were there. It's sort of, it's sort of the, the restoration led me to suddenly understand what this film has to be. This is material that was shot from 1916. It was shot by cameramen who were actually part of the British Army. The Imperial War Museum supplied Peter Jackson with hundreds of films which he painstakingly reworked over four years. It just takes a huge amount of historical research to try and get the uniforms right, the machinery right, to get all these little historical details that all help to create a more deeper and profound um, picture and impression of what it was like in the First World War. Peter Jackson's grandfather fought in the war, so this was a passion project. Unpaid, he was driven not by money, but by his long interest in the conflict. It depends on how strongly you think about whether your grandfather or great-grandfather should just be forgotten about because it's all past and, and life's all about the future or whether or not you should actually pause every now and again, just want, you know, a little bit of, just devote a little bit of time every now and again to having a, a think about your family and your past. and you know, Because we all share, we all share the, D, the DNA of those soldiers, you know. Camping. Giving the troops a new voice in this way serves as a visceral reminder that it's hoped will speak to younger generations for many years to come. Lucy Cotter, Sky News. Oh, well, interesting little video, of course, showing like the color footage because most like behind me, all you see is black and white. Uh, something, of course, that you you know always you know see with like World War One uh, type, of course, documentaries or whatever. So, anyway, I welcome you back, of course, to uh, History uh, 2023. This is Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there, uh, more or less. Uh, so, uh, anyway, of course, as you know, this week I'll be kind of wrapping up uh, war the World War I era uh, for this class. And, of course, I'll be moving on. Uh, I'll be getting into, like, the 20s this week, roaring 20s and all that. I'll be the next thing, of course, uh, after that. So, um yeah, today I'll kind of be getting more into like the United States getting more involved in World War One, like 1917, 1918. Uh, I'll talk about the end of the war, you know, the dreaded <laughs> Treaty of Versailles, 1919, that basically caused World War II, uh, of course, in the future. So we'll get to that also today, what happened after the war, you know, and all that. So uh, before we get started, of course, I want to kind of remind you, of course, a few things about uh, I think right now y'all know you've got that first exam out. Of course, y'all need to kind of wrap up this week, get that out the way, because uh, I will be having some other assignments coming up, I think, later in the week. I think on Thursday, so I'll kind of talk about that later, uh, more or less about that. So just want to kind of remind you, of course, about that uh, overall. Uh, if you have any questions, too, about the lecture, as you know, you can you know send me comments, questions, which you some of you can get bonus, of course, for that, uh, as you know. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, just send me any kind of comments, questions, or if you like, if you're watching live, you know, right now, I know most of you watch it recorded, of course, later, uh, you can, of course, send me a comment, question, more or less about it. Hey, Ross, good afternoon. Hope you're doing great out there. Yeah, it is kind of a rainy day over here, of course, but I think it's slacking off pretty much right now. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you want to join me, of course, in StreamYard.com, there, of course, is the link course, to join me. Uh, you see right there below, uh, if anybody wants to join me right now, of course, in the broadcast booth uh, for this, course, lecture, more or less. All right, so yeah, today, like I said, I'll be getting into, and I'll, of course, be talking about, you know, U.S. involvement uh, in the war, because uh, I think in the previous part one lecture, I kind of went into and discussed, you know, kind of the cause of World War I, uh, and how pretty much Europe kind of bumbled into that. Uh, war, of course, 
after the Archduke was shot, you know, so that's basically um, more or less. And then, of course, we get involved because of the German aggression, you know, that was basically uh, in, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, that's one of the things that, of course, that would occur uh, that we kind of talked about before. Uh, I think we had discussed how the United States had declared war on the date of April 6, 1917. And that was after, you know, they had the, you know, the Lusitania incident back in 1915, German aggression, uh, submarine warfare, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and then I told you about how the Zimmerman telegram with Mexico and all that kind of was like the last straw that really led into uh, the United States really getting into the war. So that's kind of some things, of course, that's going to, of course, occur with that. So I'm going to, of course, get into uh, and, of course, discuss some of the things that happened, you know, after we did uh, get in the war, uh, more or less. Uh, the United States did form an army or like some kind of military force you can see there called the AEF uh, that came in. Uh, that was developed by the United States between 1917 uh, and 1918. And um, it was all part of, by the way, uh, Congress had passed this draft in 1917, you might have heard of, called the Selective Service Act. There have been a couple of these that we've had uh, over the years, which was around up to like, I think, versions of it up to like the Vietnam War uh, that they had. It drafted American men. Uh, into basically World War I, uh, which you can see there, over a million men were eventually drafted uh, in the war. Uh, you can see the dates varied on it. Now, some men were drafted, by the way, 1917, um, from the ages of 21 to 30. Then in 1918, you can see also that they increased the actual draft uh, to 18 to 45 million. So I think somewhere between 1 and 2 million, I know, were drafted, went over there, actually fought. Uh, you can see 24 million men actually registered for the draft. Uh, there's actually a story where uh, I learned, I think, when I did some genealogy research on my grandfather years ago, he was actually was, was forced to register the draft. Uh, he was actually he was actually in college. It was like in 1918. He was at the um, Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, uh, in northern Mississippi. That's where my grandfather went. He was a pharmacy major. And uh, anyway, he got his got his draft card or whatever uh, I found, uh, and he had to register the draft, but he never served. Uh, he, he didn't have to, I guess he was in college, and I think I read somewhere that only 1% of actual college students uh, in, like, America actually served uh, in the war. Most of them were, like, working class. Uh, they were forced into the war and drafted, uh, which is something different when you get up to, like, Vietnam, where they start trying to draft people from college, which people didn't like too much, as you know. So... So, yeah, so you have, like a, like I said, one to two million men would eventually go over there. Uh, Congress also passed this thing I did want to mention about called the Espionage Act, also in 1917. That was to prevent spying because they were worried about the Germans spying on us. We had a lot of Germans, you know, United States. That's probably why they didn't want to, my relatives didn't want to fight because on my father's side, they were German, you know. And so you can imagine, I think my great grandfather was still alive when the war broke out. Uh, he he was he'd come from Germany directly, and I don't think he really liked this conflict too much. Uh, and they arrested people that they thought that might be a threat, you know, to the government, whether they be you know socialists, communists, uh, even some Germans. I think anarchists. Uh, Eugene Debs, as an example, was actually imprisoned uh, during the war. A lot of the communists and capitalists were cr uh, heavily critical toward the war because they thought it was like a capitalist type war. Uh, they were fighting in. Uh, and so a lot of them didn't really want to, you know, go into, you know, the war or, or participate. So, yeah, the, the United States formed this army, you can see, which was called the AEF, American Expeditionary Force. Uh, they would later leave uh, uh, America and go to Europe to fight over there, mostly in France uh, against the Germans. Uh, it, they did have, of course, a famous commander uh, that would head them up. Uh, which is John Pershing. Uh, he, of course, one of the most highly decorated, of course, generals in American history uh, that we've ever had. Uh, he, of course, had fought in originally in Cuba uh, during the Spanish-American War. He was, of course, mirror up there with Teddy Roosevelt when they stormed San Juan Hill. 
Uh, also, he uh, was involved in taking over the Philippines. I think I talked about the American-Filipino War. He went over there. Uh, he went after Pancho Villa, 1917, 1918, uh, after him as well, chased after him. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, he was made commander of the AEF forces also that went over there to, you know, fight in France. Uh, he was called Black Jack. I don't know if you know about that nickname, Black Jack Pershing. It's kind of a derogatory name. I don't know if you know that. But he was because he actually had originally led black troops in battle, Buffalo soldiers, which he fought with in Cuba and also in the Philippines. So it was kind of a derogatory name. Uh, but anyway, um, oh, they also had, I did want to uh, mention about uh, Douglas MacArthur. I don't know if you know about him. He became kind of famous also in World War I. Uh, they called him Dugout Doug. That was his nickname. And uh, he formed this... Uh, division that was called the Rainbow Division. It was kind of a nickname that they called the U.S. 42nd, our, uh, 42nd Division uh, that went over to fight, you know, in, in France. They were one of the first to actually get there, start fighting the Germans. And uh, they were called the uh, 42nd Division, uh, Rainbow Division, because of the fact that they had this patch on their shoulders, uh, which was like a rainbow, uh, which basically represented the fact that they were mostly National Guardsmen. They came from multiple states uh, throughout the United States. A lot of the uh, famous generals that would be like American that would be in, of course, World War II, a lot of them are in World War I, uh, like, of course, MacArthur, Patton, Eisenhower, and all that were all pretty much, you know, got their early experience in World War I initially. Uh, by the way, American soldiers in the war had different nicknames. When they went over to, like, Britain and, I guess, France, they, they were called the Yanks or Yankees. Uh, although, like, if you know about mostly people in the northern part of the United States, they're often called Yankees, not in the southern part of the United States. You probably know that. But, but yeah, they called them Yankees. Uh, I think later, I know in World War II, they used to joke that the Americans were uh, over overpaid, uh, oversexed, and over here. You know, that was the joke about it. Uh, they mostly were in France, of course, during the war. Uh, they were also called Doughboys, of course, you can see there. Uh, they called them Doughboys because the fact that they, I think, often would just all had bread to eat or something like that. And there's another theory, too, that their buttons on their uniforms look like a donut. So the term Doughboy was also kind of used as well. But yeah, our troops get over there early, like in, end of like you know 1917. But really, by the spring, around April, is when we get our full full force going. We don't really have our own army. Like the few first U.S. Army isn't formed until probably about July of 1918. So it's a little later till we really do anything in the war. And mostly, we fought on on the side with the actual French. Is what we did, kind of with their forces, more or less. Uh, before I get on to talking more about the conflict, let me also talk about something else that happened, too, uh, that's well known uh, with World War I. You also have the so-called 14 points that came out. Uh, the 14 points were a, a speech that was actually given by Woodrow Wilson in January of 1918, uh, kind of like a State of the Union address. It outlined this like peace plan, uh, which had 14 principles in it. Uh, which they thought would create lasting peace uh, in, in the country. Also, he created it, they say, uh, to try to get the Germans to try to end the war, you know, more quicker. Like they thought they would, you know, agree to terms to surrender, you know, and just end the war uh, at that point. Uh, and um, I think when they went over there, the, the average, you know, uh, European thought, thought his ideas were great, that they might be able to solve the problems of Europe, but a lot of the uh, actual like governments of like France and Britain, especially, uh, and a lot of their politicians thought his ideas were too idealistic, you know, pretty much. So too too much idealism that went into it. I think is what what they thought it was. I think it was like I'll get to George Clemenceau later, but he he was one of the leaders of, of France. He said that basically that Almighty God only had ten, you know, like ten commandments. He was kind of making fun of it. You know, all the so-called 14 points. Uh, you can see, by the way, these are some of the ideas that Woodrow Wilson wanted. Uh, try to solve the problems of Europe. Open diplomacy between different countries. Uh, freedom of the seas. Freedom of trade. Uh, 
arms reduction of different states, colonial self-determination. Uh, six to eight dealt with like German evacuation of Russia, Belgium, France, uh, including the Franco-Prussian war law. They, I think they're talking about Alsace-Lorraine, uh, which they wanted to give back to the French. Italian national unification, which, yeah, that would kind of basically, of course, happen, already kind of happened already. Uh, Ten Austro-Hungarians, uh, that they would split up that area and they would take some of the territory, of course, from Austria-Hungary and make up Czechoslovakia and other countries uh, later. Uh, Realignment of the Balkans, that would lead to like Yugoslavia being created after the war. Twelve division of the Ottoman Empire would be broken up. Uh, it would lead to Republic of Turkey formed after the war. Thirteen, independent Poland, uh, you can see. And fourteen, the thing that was, of course, more famous, you know, about uh, of course, you know, Woodrow Wilson was the so-called League of Nations that was created, you know, in 1920 after the war. That was his baby, if you know about that. Uh, he got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his idea of the League of Nations. Uh, they got in 1919 the idea of the actual Nobel Peace Prize. And um, the League of Nations was this worldwide, you can see, international government peacekeeping body that was to be created to, you know, use diplomacy uh, to prevent conflicts and wars uh, between nations. It's basically the prototype, you know, organization to the United Nations that was founded after World War II. Uh, so it's pretty much what it was. Uh, and so uh, the idea kind of, it didn't really work well later, you know, but it was a great idea, you know, that, that Woodrow Wilson, you know, came up with. Uh, at the time, it's just that he had trouble trying to get his own countrymen, like in the United States, to go along with it. Uh, like they wouldn't even accept the Treaty of Versailles after the war either. Uh, because in fact, a lot of Americans didn't really want to get directly involved uh, in Europe after the war ended, which I'll kind of explain later uh, about that. So, yeah, I'm going to get more into, the, of course, the war, you know, uh, what's what's kind of going on. Uh, and um, I'll talk next, of course, about what happened with the Germans. Here's, of course, a headlines about his proposed 14 conditions or so-called 14 points uh, that they have. Yeah, League of Nations number 14 is really the best one that he's, of course, more known for, uh, of course, overall. Uh, now, what happened at the end of the war? I'll kind of get into like, a few minutes to kind of talk about you know, what happened to like the U.S. U.S. was involved, you know, at, in the war for a while, uh, not a long time. Uh, we were in the war. Uh, you can see those are some of the battles that we fought in that were famous. Uh, battle of Belleau Wood, uh, Chateau Terry, uh, also the Battle of St. Michel, uh, you see there. Also the Meuse Argonne offensive, sometimes called the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Those were some of our you know, chief battles uh, that we fought in the most. Uh, in mostly 1918. We didn't really do too much in 1917 uh, in the war. Uh, what happened with the Germans, by the way, was the Germans, um, they basically, uh, in the war, they basically um, weren't really having to worry about the Eastern Front. Uh, one thing that's famous uh, about uh, the war that happened in 1917 was that the Russians dropped out of World War I. It was caused by the Russian Revolution, uh, where the uh, Tsar, Nicholas, Nicholas II, was actually overthrown uh, internally through a revolution and brought on the so-called Russian Revolution, or they call it also the October Revolution of 1917, where the Bolsheviks, who were led by Vladimir Lenin, who was a communist, basically took control of Russia. That's like a big civil, bloody civil war so-called Russian Civil War uh, that would kind of occur after the war. Uh, and um, eventually it led to, you can see there, the Soviet Union forming in 1922. So basically the um, Germans didn't have to fight fight on the Eastern Front anymore in 1918, I think with the so-called Brest-Litovsk Treaty, March of 1918. So pretty much they're out of the war, not having to worry about them anymore uh, with the Russians. So what happened was in Germany uh, in the spring of 1918 responded with what is called Operation Michael. It was an offensive campaign to try to help to, to try to end the war in the West, Western Front at that point. 
And what happened was the Germans uh, responded by breaking, almost breaking through the Allied defense lines. Uh, this is in northern France. Uh, and they formed actually salients or bulges uh, throughout the actual Allied lines, which there's some cases where the Germans drove back the Allies something like 40 miles, you can see there. They looked like they were going to kind of break through. It might even push on to Paris uh, by the end of the war. Uh, however, what happened was the United States was a lot to do with why the war turned in, in the Allies' favor. Uh, American forces were kind of fresh troops uh, that came into the war. Battle of, Chate Battle of Bello Wood, Chateau Terry, that happens in the summer of 1918. Those are kind of pivotal battles. Battle of St. Michelle also as well. Our biggest battle, though, uh, they talk about is that uh, is that really uh, the after the uh, United States First Army is founded, uh, you've got basically the so-called Second Battle of the Mar uh, that occurs in the summer of 1918. Uh, that particular battle was really one of our most important ones uh, that we had. We suffered high casualties. You can see uh, in that battle, 45,000 uh, were killed and wounded. Uh, overall, probably one of our bloodiest battles before they had the Bussard gone. Uh, offensive. Uh, and um, anyway, um, what happened uh, from there, the Allies were able to eventually counterattack uh, the Germans. Massive offensive, uh, which it's got different names. I think they usually call it the so-called 100 Days Offensive, which started in August of 1918. It goes all the way up to the end of the war in November 11th. It's called that because it lasted 100 days or a little over three months. It involved like basically the French, British, Americans were the main forces that really fought, fought the Germans. They were trying to basically push back the Germans' uh, main defense line, which was called the Hindenburg Line, uh, which had been formed in 1917. So it was a massive offensive. Two main troops, you see, that were actually involved at one point. Uh, the most famous part of it, by the way, was the so-called Meuse-Argonne Offensive. That was the most pivotal aspect of the 100 Days Offensive. It's usually called it also to, I think a lot of Americans call it the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Uh, and um, that was really our most famous battle that the United States fought in the war. Uh, we took like something like 26,000 where Americans were killed in the battle. Uh, which I think is, I want to say, I think the second bloodiest uh, battle we've ever fought in uh, where Americans were killed. I think Battle of Normandy, I know in Battle of the Bulge, those were some of the most bloodiest we had later, I know in World War II, they were more than that. But um, basically, yeah, with, with the Battle of Argonne Forest or Meuse Argonne, which was fought in the, kind of like north of Verdun, Verdun in, in the northeastern part of France where they fought, uh, they did drive the Germans back. Like they broke the Hindenburg line. And then from there, the, the, the Allies were able to push the Germans back into Belgium. It looked like they were going to probably push them back into Germany. But, of course, the war came to an end uh, eventually later, November 11th, which I'll kind of talk about. Uh, one thing about the American side, I did want to mention a few things uh, that's kind of well known about the Argonne battle. Uh, they had these famous, you know, soldiers they talk about that were kind of well known during the war, which one of the most decorated was um, Alvin York, uh, who was from, by the way, Paul Mall, Tennessee. He was a country boy. Uh, and uh, anyway, he was one of the biggest heroes of the whole war on the American side. Uh, he was most decorated. You know, they had. Uh, and he received, you can see there, the Congressional Medal of Honor, 1918, uh, for his heroic, heroics in the Argonne Force battle, which they made movies about. I mean, if you know about that. Uh, and apparently his unit got pinned down by uh, German machine guns in the German army. And so if you know what happened, he went in there almost single-handedly and took out basically a whole unit of Germans he killed 35 Germans, captured 122 by himself, almost single-handedly, kind of like a, like a Rambo. You know, I guess that's where Rambo came from, you know, the original Rambo, Alvin York. Uh, and, 
Yeah, they made Hollywood movies, which I think the most famous you may have heard of is Gary Cooper's famous movie, Sergeant York, which is, I think, a black and white film originally, which talks about his heroics after the war. I think he was a Quaker. He was like one of these guys that was really, uh, like, really kind of a guy that didn't, want, didn't believe in killing people, you know, and all that. He was a pacifist originally. Uh, also, uh, you may have heard of this other story as well, did want to mention about, which is the Lost Battalion. And that was, of course, something that was also very famous uh, also uh, in, in, um, in World War I. Uh, you had this battalion, by the way, that was called the Lost Battalion, which was really called the U.S. Army 77th Division. And it, what happened was they got pinned down in the Battle of Argonne Force. They were surrounded about five, 600 men under this uh, officer named Major Charles Whittlesey. Uh, and um, to actually get help, like reinforcements to you know free them, basically, uh, they had to send homing pigeons out. And it was one pigeon that was very famous. It was called Cher Ami, uh, which means dear friend uh, in French. And uh, they were able to get help, by the way, uh, and I think he later got, I think he got a medal too, I think, or something like that. Of course, also, they made a good movie out of that too, uh, which I think Ricky Schroeder's in, if you ever want to watch it, which goes into it, which is, I thought that was one of the best movies about that, that top topic or whatever. Uh, but um, yeah, that's kind of some of the famous aurorics of some Americans that, you know, were fighting you know, in, in that campaign uh, that was real, real bloody, you know, for us, you know, during the war. Uh, well, what happened to the Germans? Yeah, their army started collapsing uh, at the end of the war. Would you? Know, they got pushed into, into Belgium, but uh, they had other things that they think caused it also as well. Uh, they think that the German forces were running out of experienced men. Uh, they all the a lot of their best veterans, you know, had been killed in the war or they were wounded. Uh, also, they were riddled by Spanish flu, the influenza, uh, or flu. I'll talk about that later uh, after the war. Uh, that that basically is something that's well known, you know, with the war. Uh, also, uh, the um, German Revolution also broke out uh, too, uh, as well. Uh, and um, basically, the their people back home rebelled because because of the war. They were kind of sick of the war. They they've been blockaded by the way uh, by the Allies, uh, and so um, they actually forced the the uh, actual Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, to, excuse me, yeah, Kaiser, yeah, Ka, yeah, Kaiser Wilhelm II to abdicate uh, 1918. And the Germans would actually put in a republic, which was called the Weimar Republic after the war. So I kind of just talking about what happened, you know, with the Germans. Uh, the Germans eventually do surrender uh, in the way the war eventually comes to an end uh, is what eventually happens on November 11th. 1918, of course, what ends up happening, you can see there, is that both sides decide to sign an armistice, uh, which which ended the war. Uh, like you right here, they were actually signed in northern France in the Forest Compiègne. It's like kind of like north of Paris. Uh, and it was signed in a railway car uh, between basically the Germans and I guess representatives of, of the Allied side, the French, etc. Kind of ironic about that railway cart later if you know about it because Heather's kind of mad about it later after the in World War II. You know about it, he makes the French E. Crow 1940 when he invades France. They signed that too, like signed another armistice in 1940. Of course, I'll get to that maybe later. We have time. But um yeah, so basically the war is over, you know, at that point. Uh, but obviously they're gonna have to, you know, have some kind of treaty that's going to end the war, especially with the Germans. And so that's something that they're going to have to work on, of course, in 1919, which I'll get to next with the Paris Peace Conference, of course. So the Huns, the Huns gave up, basically, and that's pretty much the end, end of the war. They always joke about the end of the war as so-called in the war to end all wars. Uh, the fact that it ended on the 11th day of the 11th hour of the 11th month, you know, et cetera. So, yeah, you know, possibly, but of course, we if we find up later, it's not <laughs> World War II that comes later, just much much bloodier, you know. 
Uh, let's also talk about too. I'll get into in, let's get into and talk about also what happened after the war. So you also got the Paris Peace Conference you know, that follows uh, after the war. Uh, as you know, between January to June 1919, you got the Paris Peace Conference uh, where where the Allies meet there to decide the fate of, of the you know, their enemies, like the Germans after the war. They discussed the peace terms, you know, of the end of the war. And if you know about it, it was dominated by these four states, which were often called the Big Four, uh, United States, France, uh, Britain, of course, and also Italy. Uh, and um, you can see it right here, uh, where later on they would actually sign the actual treaty that would end the war, the Palace of Versailles, Treaty of Versailles, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, and... Um, the actual um, four states, which I'll mention about, had these four representatives that were there. It's kind of a debate about who the big four were. Is, is, it, the, is it the countries or is, this, is it the actual heads of state? It was actually all, I think it was both, what it was. And uh, it included these four, four leaders, you can see. Uh, you had David Lloyd George of, of Great Britain, British Empire, Tori Orlando of Italy, George Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson of the United States. You can see him in that picture there, by the way. Uh, David Lloyd George is the one that's on the far left right here. Um, where Tori Orlando was the one kind of pointing his finger at the other guy right here, George Clemenceau, and, of course, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, of course, I told you George Clemenceau really didn't like Woodrow Wilson in his 14 points. thought they were too idealistic. I think I told you he was the one who said it was kind of like, you know, God's already got the Ten Commandments. Like, we need that, you know, also as well. Uh, but um, mostly in the Paris Peace Conference, it's mostly really France and, and Britain. Those two states really dominated the most in maybe the United States uh, after that. But pretty much both those states, uh, Britain and France, wanted to punish, you know, the Germans after the war. Uh, they weren't too happy about the war. Of course, a lot of men had been lost in the West, like the French and the British lost a lot of men that were killed in the war. Uh, and um, what exactly was in the Treaty of Versailles? That's something we need to talk about a little bit because, uh, you know, it does help to cause World War II later uh, with the rise of Hitler, you know, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and um, one of the big things that happened, like I said, was, was the Germans got heavily punished you know, for the war. Uh, and um, these are some things, of course, that happened. The Germans lost all their colonies, you know, to the Allies. So they had like in Africa, uh, in the Pacific, uh, et cetera. Alsace-Lorraine, we talked about that already. Uh, the fact that that went to the French, which the French had lost in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 -71. Uh, the Germans also had to accept this thing called the War Guilt Clause. It was called Article 231 that was put into the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and it basically said that they were responsible for the war, that they had caused it. They really didn't start it, but they were kind of blamed for the war because they were seen as the aggressors. And uh, they were told if they didn't sign it, that they'd be invaded and occupied. They might take some of their territory even more. Uh, the Germans also were only allowed to have like a defensive army of about 100,000 troops. Uh, no Navy. Uh, no, they got to get rid of their airplanes, like their Air Force uh, and all that. Then the big thing they had, of course, was that they had to pay the Allies $32 billion uh, worth of war, of war reparations. Uh, that's a lot of money, uh, which it would take them, by the way, years to pay it. Uh, I, think, I think they want to say they eventually paid it back. Uh, in about, I think, 80 years or something like that or so. They paid it so recently, so many years ago, I know. They did pay it all back, believe it or not. Although Hitler refused to pay it for a while, you know about that, under the Nazis. But um, so, yeah, those are all the things that really went into the treaty. All that basically, you know, more or less, you know, punished, like I said, the Germans. It only helped to make it worse, I think, for Germany after the war. It later led to the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, you know, which in, in the end kind of helped to, you know, lead into, of course, you know, World War One. There, of course, right there, you can see uh, the Treaty of Versailles. 
Uh, it was signed, by the way, on June 28th, 1919, which, by the way, is interesting about that five-year anniversary, the Archduke getting shot. Isn't that kind of funny uh, about that, the date they picked, of course, for that? You can see also, of course, the League of Nations was created after the war, which I think it was uh, became uh, real in 1920. And I think it was around until 1946 when the U.N. replaced it, more or less. Uh, also, a few other things I did want to mention, too, about the war as well. There's some more stuff. You can see there's some stuff they also took. They, uh, later, uh, of course, I think not yet, but they'll demilitarize the Rhineland for a long time. Of course, the 1930s, you can see that also as well. So, yeah, they basically had to uh, sign or get invaded. It was pretty much, you know, the poor Germans, uh, they were forced to really you know, do that uh, overall. But, um, yeah, uh, of course, if you look at Europe, you know, after World War I, you can see that Europe was totally rearranged, especially in Central Eastern Europe. And uh, you can see how you have all these new countries that are formed, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in the Baltic states uh, in the eastern part of Europe. That was all basically became states as well, but Poland. Yugoslavia, Finland became a new country after the war. Austria and Hungary, those two countries which were together, you know, part of the, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, were all basically separated from each other. So it became two separate states. So you can kind of see the areas of where, you know, like that area right here, uh, which is in the middle, uh, that this area right here, that was all what was, you know, Austria-Hungary uh, was all broken up. It was made into multiple states. So you got Yugoslavia right here. Romania expanded. Let me like over here as well. You can see Poland was made up of multiple states, part of Russia, part of Germany, and also part of Austria-Hungary as well. Uh, Turkey will be a state too later, uh, but it doesn't found until 1923 is when that will happen. Also, the British and French go into the Middle East. They occupy like um, Syria, Iraq, Israel, Lebanon, all that area is all occupied by um, the British and French and the so-called mandates that they have after the war, where they're kind of trying to figure out what they're going to do with all that former Ottoman Empire territory. And it's going to later form into different countries, uh, usually after World War II, uh, when that'll be. So not yet, but that'll be much later. Of course, the Arabs will want more. That's one thing about War One. Arab nationalism became a lot of Arabs, you know, start, you know, trying to push for nationalism, you know, after the war. Jews also start to push for, uh, as you know, nationalism, uh, Jewish state. Uh, the British even had that so-called Balfour Declaration, you know, with the belief that there ought to be a Jewish state. It's something they, of course, talked about during the war at the time. Uh, casualties in the war. Well, yeah, uh, he has a lot. Nine million, almost or almost nine million soldiers died in World War I. We didn't have as many casualties, of course, in the war uh, compared to, you know, some of these other countries that were participating more or less. Um, if you want to know the casualty rates uh, in the war, I can kind of read them out for you, but we only had about 130,000 Americans die uh, in the war. So that's about it. Uh, for how many people we had uh, that died. Uh, but um, 1.4 million French dead. Yeah, British almost a million, Russians 1.7 million dead. That's on the Allied side. Germans 1.8 million dead. Austrians or Austro-Hungarian Empire 1.2 million dead. That's kind of surprising. Ottoman Turks 325,000 dead, of course, in the war. So kind of just some estimates on that total. Civilian deaths. Maybe about 20 million, I think they estimate uh, as well. And then they have the Spanish influenza pandemic. That's something you may have heard about that's real famous, you know, about World War I. Uh, close to 50 million. Some people think 100 million. I don't kind of know how much it was exactly. It's been kind of a debate about that. But close to 50 million may have died worldwide uh, because of the Spanish flu. They think it started in the United States, in like what is Kansas, uh, where farm boys uh, who were working. I think on, on on like some kind of 
livestock farm with, with swine, like pigs. And they got the swine flu. They gave the troops while uh, they were going off to war. They brought it to Europe. And then from Europe, it spread all over the world. Uh, and over time, uh, in America, it killed like something like maybe not quite 1% of the population uh, at the time. But they think over 600,000 Americans died of the flu, like 600, 700,000 range, uh, roughly, they believe. That was out of a population of 105 million. Now our population is like more than three times that, of course, today. Uh, but it has often been compared, you know, with obviously COVID right now, uh, which I think COVID, the amount of deaths, you know, really it's like you compare it with like population-wise, it's only a tenth of the percentage of the population that really died uh, from it. I know I think we're in that range, the same amount you know, with the uh, flu that died back then. But but back then, you see the population was only 105 million. So that's actually a lot of people. If you think if you could do the math on it uh, with that. Uh, people always ask me, why is it called Spanish flu? Uh, because uh, in Spain, they weren't as like, um, they, didn't have, they, they didn't have as much censorship. And so the newspapers were talking about how many people were dying, you know, and all that uh, in Europe. Uh, with this strange illness uh, that took off. And the king of Spain got it too. Well, apparently, I didn't even die of it, but, but I know it's something that they kind of knew about uh, and all that. And so people started calling it the Spanish flu, uh, but they don't think it originated in Spain. It, they think it originated in America, uh, where it was. They think India may have had the most deaths. I see different numbers on that, but maybe as many as 20 million have actually died of it there, which is quite a lot. You know, 20 million. Um, now, let me get into the United States, uh, more or less, you know, what happened after the war. I uh, do have, of course, uh, I think I've got some stuff, you know, looking at a picture here, um, uh, basically. So, yeah, 675,000, that might be the actual bout of people that may have died. Uh, highest mortality rate you see were people that were aged between 20 to 40. That's one thing that was different about the influenza pandemic uh, compared to COVID. COVID is mostly the old, older, elder people, like 70s, 80s, like the older people are mostly dying from it. Uh, 20, 40 million, that might be an average. They think it could have been 50 million. I've seen numbers as high as 100 million I may mean, have died from it uh, also as well. So a lot of people got it uh, overall. All right, I'm going to get into next, and I want to talk about the fact that the United States after the war didn't really want to have anything to do with the Treaty of Versailles uh, or even the League of Nations. Uh, we actually kind of rejected it. Uh, in fact, we never really joined officially the League of Nations. Uh, I don't think we did. Uh, and what happened was the U.S. Senate, which has to ratify treaties, if you know about this, refused to do it because uh, we didn't really want to get directly involved in Europe's problems, especially after the war. Uh, you know, and so there was a lot of opposition. Apparently, uh, what happened when Wilson went over to uh, Europe, he didn't bring any Republicans with him, just Democrats uh, that went with him. And so the opposition in Senate, Republicans, uh, which were led by Cabot, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was one of the majority leaders of the Republicans, refused to support it. Uh, and so they totally opposed uh, the Treaty of Versailles. I don't think we uh, ratified the treaty until 1923. Believe it or not, yeah, four years later, it happens, I think, under, I want to say Calvin Coolidge or something like that. They eventually did it. And uh, Wilson, uh, he actually wanted to try to, you know, get the this treaty, you know, ratified. He also wanted the United States to get involved in the League of Nations. And so he did the speaking tour in 1919, where he went all across the United States trying to get support uh, for the Treaty of Versailles being ratified. Uh, and believe, us getting in the League of Nations uh, as well. What happened was he suffered a stroke uh, in October of 1919 and became incapacitated, you know, something that happened. Uh, and um, as you know, uh, they, we, we basically, you know, we basically, it's defeated. I think the Senate defeated the treaty. You can see there, 49 to 35 uh, right there. So you can see that. Uh, but um, but anyway, um, yeah, he's, he's basically incapacitated, you know, at that point. And 
So from 1919 to 1921, uh, he's an invalid in the White House. Uh, there's no 25th Amendment to remove him from power and put, say, in the vice president, which I guess you could do now. Uh, and so what happened was his wife, you know about that first lady, Edith Wilson, practically ran the White House uh, herself. Self. She was kind of like the acting president of the United States. And I know how they say there's never been a female president. Well, she was the close that they got. You want to say she was. They call her the secret president. I think was what they dubbed her, uh, Edith Wilson. Uh, so she got was the acting president, you know, uh, during that during that period. But Wilson was really kind of out of it, you know, and he would die a few years later, of course, after he went, went out of office uh, overall. All right. So um, anyway, uh, so that's basically, you know, what happened with Woodrow Wilson, you know, going out. But we'll, we'll talk more about Wilson. Uh, and uh, I will be, of course, moving on uh, to kind of get into uh, talking about the so-called Roaring Twenties uh, that'll come in. Of course, it's not really roaring yet uh, that they'll have, uh, but I'll kind of, you know, get to that today uh, overall. And um yeah, America in the 20s, of course, is later called the Roaring, it's called the Roaring 20s. Uh, although if you read about the United States, um, it doesn't really roar <laughs> like the economy doesn't really anyway uh, until really 1923 is when, when that, of course, occur. Uh, because the fact that after the war, the United States suffered through a economic situation, like we kind of have this post-war depression or recession. It's kind of been a debate about whether it was really a depression. I know in Europe it was. I think Europe kind of went through a post-war depression uh, after the war, uh, which helped bring on fascism uh, in Europe, uh, which we'll kind of talk about later. Uh, but some people think it was like a bad recession uh, that occurred. And uh, like I said, pro the prosperous roaring 20s don't occur until really under Calvin Coolidge's administrations when it, when it mostly peaked, uh, 1923 uh, to about 1929. That's usually considered the so-called roaring 20s. Some people call it the golden 20s, I think as well, uh, that they called it. And um, one of the main things, of course, that happened uh, in – We'll come back more into the Roaring Twenties about what occurred uh, at that time. But one of the things that happened was you had a new president that came in, uh, who, of course, was Warren G. Harding. Uh, and they had the so-called 1920 presidential election that happened right after World War I. Uh, and Democrats, you know, they wanted to run on the issue, of course, of ratifying the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and so, you know, um, they thought that was going to, that was going to be the issue, you know, of what, what, you know, this election was going to be out. I mean, we need to join the League of Nations. We need to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and, but, you know, a lot of Americans really didn't really want to get involved, you know, in, in Europe. And so Republicans had a bigger advantage. They basically, you know, about, uh, President Hardy, he ran on this slogan that was basically, he called it return to normalcy, is what he called it. And they rejected basically Europe's problems uh, and all that. Uh, and um, it's from a speech that he gave uh, that was famous, uh, where he said, basically, he said that America's, America's need is not heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalcy, not agitation but adjustment, not surgery, but serenity, not the dramatic, but the dispassionate. Uh, so he sensed what America needed was to return to normalcy, back to peacetime, uh, more or less. Some people think that's what they need today with this, you know, this virus thing, this COVID. They need to go back to normal eventually, uh, like, you know, like we were before, I guess in 2019, I guess. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much his view, you know, of, how things need to be, they go back to normal. I think he invented the word normalcy, which they made fun of. It wasn't a word in the dictionary. And I think he said that it wasn't his. <laughs> That's what it was. Um, Harding, who was from Ohio, who's a Republican, ran against James Cox, 
who was also from Ohio. He was actually the governor of Ohio. So you got two guys running. Uh, they were from Ohio. And what happened in the election, um, what occurred uh, was um, Harding, ran, Harding won in a landslide. Yeah. Um, in, in 1920, uh, I think he got, you can see there he won like 64% of the popular vote uh, with 404 electoral votes. That's quite a lot. It's a big landslide. Like I think oh, it must have been the, one of the first to get over 400 electoral votes uh, in an election. And you can see that uh, Warren Hardy, uh, that James Cox there below, only got 128 electoral votes. That's not too much, uh, you can see. But you can see that the Democrats are still holding on to the South still. Uh, they hold on that forever, you know, just about. Now, the only thing about, of course, you know, when, you know, as he's coming in at that point, you know, there's a lot of problems in the country between 1919 uh, to 1921 uh, that I want to kind of get into. Uh, after the war ended, uh, a lot of your wartime industries basically closed. Uh, because, you know, they had been making weapons and other things for war, like wartime you know, materials, et cetera. And so they were having to convert to peacetime production. It was a real, real big problem. And so a lot of people were put out of work, factories closed, business closed. Uh, and, of course, it led to a lot of, you know, high unemployment uh, that they had. Uh, and so you had a cases where a lot of, you know, workers like went on strike, you know, because they they weren't getting enough pay, uh, and all that uh, in the in the war. Veterans, by the way, uh, were returning from the war, and they couldn't find jobs either. Uh, the average price of farm produce also dropped, so crops you were growing and starting to make money on or whatever weren't worth as much. Wages also fell drastically, also as well, uh, at the same time. So all this is kind of going on. You can see as many as maybe four million. Workers may have actually gone on strike uh, during, of course, this whole time, 1919 being the worst, of course, overall. Yeah, there were strikes between 1918 and 1920 uh, that they had uh, overall, but 1919 was really considered to be the worst year uh, where it was, of course, the worst, uh, more or less. Uh, let me talk about examples of some of these different strikes that they had. Uh, of course, in America, there was one that was called the so-called Boston Police Strike, which was in 1919. Uh, this was where the actual Boston police force went on strike because they wanted to basically have better wages. They thought they weren't getting paid enough uh, and all that, better conditions. Uh, and what happened was it caused rioting, looting uh, in, in basically Boston, Massachusetts, in the Basically, the, the the Massachusetts governor, which was Calvin Coolidge at the time, before he, he was later vice president under uh, Harding, he basically had to call out the National Guard because uh, they didn't have any police. <laughs> you know, like it's all he sees there, burning stuff down, uh, kind of like that. Uh, and and so Coolidge made a famous statement, by the way, that became real famous. He said, "There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere." any time. And if you know about Coolidge, he didn't talk much. He was done a silent cow. Uh, you know, he used to make jokes about it because he didn't talk much. And uh, anyway, uh, he, he fired them all. The whole police force was fired, basically. He hired new people. Uh, and of course, it led to Coolidge being vice president later uh, on Harding, you know, when he ran for power in 1920, more or less. So that's how, that's how Coolidge became famous and later became VP. So he'll be president later, of course. Now I'll get to like Harding dying. I don't think I'll get to that today, but uh, Harding's going to eventually die. And of course, Coolidge will come in later, the roaring 20s. Uh, they also had the United Mine Workers strike too. Uh, that was another one. The United Mine Workers, they strike too as well uh, in the winter of 1919. Uh, apparently, John L. Lewis, who's the head of the, that, of the UMW, uh, decided to go on strike again which they had done before under Teddy Roosevelt, if you remember correctly, in 1902. Well, yeah, they, they weren't happy either. They wanted better wages. They wanted a shorter work week. I think they were working six days a week. They wanted a five-day work week. And so they went on strike, but not just in Pennsylvania. They went on strike throughout the whole country. 
uh, which was really a big, big problem uh, as well. So you have that going on. Uh, then they had the AFL steel strike, which I think wasn't as successful compared to some of the other strikes as well. That was where 300,000 steel workers throughout the country went on strike uh, as well, which kind of turned violent. In some places, like in Indiana, you can see there, and they, they wanted to strike too for better working conditions and also better wages as well. So this is kind of the stuff that was kind of going on uh, after, after World War I. There's a lot of Americans that thought that the people that were behind all this were socialists or communists, uh, which is, of course, may have been true somewhat, you know, because the fact that, you know, some of these people, you know, uh, were considered that uh, they were kind of part of the unions and so on. And uh, so you have all these social problems that they start kind of coming up. Uh, and uh, one thing that's very, very, very famous about the 1920s, which you may have heard about, was they had the so-called Red Scare that happened after World War I from 1919 to 1920. It's often called the first Red Scare because there was a second one after World War II uh, in, in basically the late 1940s and early 1950s. And um, in the United States, there was a fear that communists or socialists were going to take over the country. It was mass hysteria. Uh, people thought there were communists everywhere. And uh, the reason why was because the fact the reason for it was because, you know, what would happen in Europe, you had Russia being taken over by communists. Uh, there was also later attempts to take over like Germany and I think Italy as well uh, by various socialist type groups. So a lot of people were very, very fearful about this. So under Wilson's administration, there was this guy named Mitchell Palmer, who was the attorney general. He actually started doing these raids uh, across the country uh, to arrest anybody that was considered to be a socialist, a communist, an anarchist, and he threw people in prison, including Eugene Debs. I think he was in prison uh, at the time in 1920. And actually, ran for president when he was in prison. He actually pulled like almost a million votes, which is crazy. <laughs> and um, anyway, they, they were called the Palmer Raids. You may have heard about this. Uh, and a bunch of Americans were actually deported from the country. Uh, they were actually sent to the Soviet Union. Which is true about this. And uh, they were put on this ship called the USS Buford, which was like a U.S. Navy ship. I think it was a cargo ship or some type. And people joked it was called the Red Ark or the Soviet Ark. Uh, and they sent, they can see a bunch of people there uh, to be deported, of course. So anybody they thought that was kind of radical, you know, you hear about this. I think there's a good movie about that. You may have seen it called, you ever seen Reds? It kind of talks about that of how some of these people were actually arrested and deported. And I think Emma Goldman, I don't know if you've heard of her, Emma Goldman, I think she was an anarchist or something like that. She was sent to the Soviet Union. They thought it was all great when they got there, but they find out it's not all cracked up to be, you know, of course, when they get there. So, yeah, it was all, it was all because, of you know, like I said, the, the, like I said, the Bolsheviks, you know, all these communists that were socialists that were taking over, you know, parts of Europe. That was the reason, you know, for it. Uh, more or less. Uh, also, most people don't know this, but the first Red Scare also caused the rise of the Ku Klux Klan again, like a second version of it came up uh, as well, which became very popular, by the way, uh, around World War I or right after. Uh, and it was more geared towards nativism, which nativism was a, a type of movement where they're supportive of like American ideals and American people that are here but they're anti-immigrant. They hate immigrants uh, that are coming here uh, and all that and don't want them here, especially those that are Irish, like your Italians, uh, your, your you know, Irish, Catholics, you know, those kind of Jews also as well. Uh, none of those were Protestant Christians. Uh, and so Ku Klux Klan uh, at one point had several million people that were members, uh, I think, in the early 1920s. I think they actually marched on Washington at one point. Uh, there's actually pictures and video of them marching through the streets of Washington, which I know sounds crazy, but they did at one point. Uh, so, yeah, you have this hatred. That, you know, that's one thing about the Red Scare. It produced a lot of hatred towards immigrants that were coming from Europe, mostly from like southern, eastern Europe, uh, et cetera. And so you have these things that you may have heard of that, that I don't know if you heard about the early 1920s, but you had the 
Sacco and Van Setti trial, the very, very famous incident that happened uh, at the beginning of the 1920s uh, involved with this whole, you know, so-called red scare uh, at the time. And uh, uh, Sacco and Van Setti were these Italian anarchists that were basically arrested uh, for armed robbery. They think they were involved in robbing a shoe factory uh, in Braintree, Massachusetts, where they killed two men uh, in the robbery. And uh, they were put on trial, uh, and it became like a sensation, the actual trial itself. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, the judge and the jury uh, were basically prejudiced toward them because they were Italian, uh, Catholic, and I think maybe anarchists uh, as well. So they were given an unfair trial, and eventually they were executed in 1927. Uh, some people thought they were innocent, uh, or some people thought they maybe were treated badly you know, in the trial and should have gotten a better trial. There's a debate about maybe, maybe one of them may have been behind it. Maybe Sacco may have been the one that may have done it. Uh, but they got they got a real bad rap, you know, because of what happened with that. So a lot of Italians, you know, Catholics, people like that that were coming to the country were being treated badly uh, by people. It's part of why they have like, you know, Columbus Day. Some of the Italians would develop later, you know, the Irish had St. Patrick's Day, you know, things like that. Uh, to kind of give more respect towards being Italian or being Irish. That's why it becomes such a popular, you know, holidays, you know, all later. Uh, although also this other thing that happened too, I'll kind of mention about, which is famous uh, in the 1920s was the Scopes trial. I didn't want to kind of mention about that, which was kind of funny, uh, but they had this deal where in 1925, uh, it was a famous court case where, a biology teacher, John T. Scopes, was arrested for teaching Darwinism, you know, with the theories of evolution that, you know, Charles Darwin developed in, in Britain years back in the 19th century. He was arrested for it. And apparently uh, Scopes had violated an act in Tennessee, some kind of law called the Butler Act, where it said that you couldn't, you know, you had to teach about creationism. The fact that, you know, God created the earth, you know, Adam and Eve and all that, and you couldn't teach theories of evolution uh, and all that. So he, he got arrested for it. And it became this sensational trial uh, eventually, which involved, uh, if you know about this, it involved uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, in Clarence Darrow. Uh, Bryan you know, had run for president several times. He'd been Secretary of, St Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. He was actually the prosecutor in the case. I mean, Clarence Darrow was the defense attorney. Uh, and Scopes eventually lost. He was actually found guilty. I don't know if you know that or not, but he was. Uh, and he had to pay a fine for it, believe it or not. So it's kind of talking about some of these social issues that occurred, of course, uh, in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, I am going to get into it later. Uh, of course, we'll talk about it also as well. Uh, we'll talk about the Prohibition era. Uh, that's going to be a topic which, you know, is very, very famous uh, in the Roaring Twenties. Of course, leads to bootlegging and, of course, the rise of the mafia, uh, you know, in, in America as a whole. Uh, you, of course, got the rise of the flappers. You can see there, too. <laughs> hey, flappers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit uh, also as well that we have. So I'll get into that. The fact that they try to ban alcohol, you know, in the 1920s. And all that. Now, I'll talk about the culture of the Roaring Twenties, which is, of course, known for like jazz music, you know, and development of radio uh, kind of starts to come out. A lot of your big sports, baseball, you know, becomes real popular, you know, about that. You heard of Babe Ruth, probably the biggest baseball player, you know, in the 1920s. Maybe heard of Newt Rockney, was a famous football coach for Notre Dame. Uh, that's, you may have probably heard of him too, uh, as well. We'll talk about different cultural things, of course, associated with the, you know, so-called Roaring Twenties. So that's it for today. Uh, like I said, if you have any comments, questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, let me know later, of course, on my channel. Um, don't forget, you know, you have assignments that are due right now. Most of the main one, of course, is the first exam. So to get that wrap up this week, uh, get that out the way because, you know, you will have other assignments upcoming uh, later uh, to get done. 
So, because I'm gonna have a quiz later coming up, I think by by Thursday, um, which we'll have like on I think the early 1920s, going back to Teddy Roosevelt's time and all that. So that's it for today. Uh, y'all take care and hope y'all have a good rest of the week. I'll of course be back with another lecture course later in a couple of days. So take care. Have a great week.